Good morning, brothers and sisters. So we are going to start doing part four. And again, if you have not done parts one through three, these teachings all build upon each other. And so it would behoove you to really go back and watch each of the previous videos before you get to this point so that you have a better understanding of what it is that we're, we're diving into here. And so what we've been talking about is all the things that Jesus said would happen when we would see the abomination of desolation, the tribulation, you know, the signs of his coming. And so today we are going to look at the piece of Matthew 24, 15 that says, so when you see the abomination of desolation spoken of by the prophet Daniel standing in the holy place, let the reader understand. And so what is an abomination that would cause a desolation? And desolation means lay waste, make destitute, barren, desecration that results from being cut off. We're going to start with when the people of God were told that they were being given land. God told them that the people in the land that were being driven out due to their abominations, that because that they did these things, the land had been become unclean. And so anyone who participated in them would be cut off from among the people. That is in Leviticus 18. And they were told, you are to practice my judgments and keep my statutes by walking in them. I am the Lord your God. Keep my statutes and my judgments, for the man who does these things will live by them. I am the Lord. And judgments here means the act of deciding a case, procedures, ordinances. So a few scriptures we're going to go over about this. First one is in Deuteronomy 18, 10 through 12. It says, let no one be found among you who sacrifices his son or daughter in the fire, practice did practices divination or conjury, interprets omens, practice sorcery, casts spells, consults a medium or a spiritist, or inquires of the dead. For whoever does these things is detestable to the Lord, and because of these detestable things, the Lord your God is driving out the nations before you. In Jeremiah 7, 7, 22 through 28, it says, For when I brought your fathers out of the land of Egypt, I did not merely command them about burnt offerings and sacrifices, but this is what I commanded them. Obey me, and I will be your God, and you will be my people. You must walk in all the ways that I have commanded you, so that it will go well with you. Yet they did not listen or incline their ear, but they followed the stubborn inclinations of their own evil hearts. They went backward and not forward. From the day your fathers came out of the land of Egypt until this day, I have sent you all my servants, the prophets, again and again. Yet they would not listen to me or incline their ear, but they stiffened their necks and did more evil than their fathers. When you tell them all of these things, they will not listen to you. When you call to them, they will not answer. Therefore, you must say to them, this is a nation that would not listen to the voice of the Lord their God and would not receive correction. Truth has perished. It has disappeared from their lips. Verse 30 says, For the sons of Judah have done evil in my sight, declares the Lord. They have set their detestable things in the house that is called by my name to defile it. 34 says, I will remove from the cities of Judah and the streets of Jerusalem the sounds of joy and gladness and the voice of the bride and the bridegroom, for the land will become a wasteland. And that's repeated in Revelation 18.23. Ezekiel, I am so sorry, this thing is acting wonky for some reason. Ezekiel 33.25-29 says, Therefore, tell them this is what the Lord God says. You eat meat with blood in it. You lift up your eyes to your idols and shed blood. Should you then possess the land? You have relied on your swords and have committed detestable acts, and each of you has defiled his neighbor's wife. Should you then possess the land? Tell them this is what the Lord God says. 
As surely as I live, those in the ruins will fall by the sword. Those in the open field I will give to be devoured by wild animals, and those in the strongholds and the caves will die by the plague. I will make the land a desolate waste, and the pride of her strength will come to an end. The mountains of Israel will become desolate so that no one will pass through. Then they will know that I am the Lord, when I have made the land a desolate waste because of all of the abominations that they have committed." Verse 31 through 33 says, So my people come to you as usual, sit before you and hear your words, but they do not put them into practice. Although they express love with their mouths, their hearts pursue dishonest gain. Indeed, you are like to them, like a singer of love with songs, with a beautiful voice who skillfully plays in instruments. They hear your words, but they do not put them into practice. So when it comes to pass, and it surely will come, then they will know that a prophet has been among them. And I hope you recognize that Jesus said those words too. So boiling it down to its simplest form here, it's it's idolatry. And if we look at each example throughout the history of the Bible, it was always idolatry that brought destruction. And idolatry is largely not understood in the church because it's not taught. It's it's made out to be those who worship false gods that are not actually gods. But, you know, this isn't the only form of idolatry. And I unfortunately, I, I can't really go into some of the things that I just spoke to you about. Um, but if we could rightly discern those things that they did, we would clearly see that we are engaged in each and every single one of those same exact things today in the church. But idolatry brought the Babylonian captivity. It brought the wrath of God and the destruction of the land. And although King Nebuchadnezzar turned to God, his son refused to heed. And when he saw that his father lived as an animal for seven years, he still got into idolatry. In turn, this brought an end to the Babylonian rule and turned it over to the Medes and the Persians. <clears throat> King Darius ruled first and then Cyrus. So when the Lord told the Israelites to possess the land, they were told in Exodus 23 through 24, for my angel, which just means messenger, will go before you and bring you into the land of the Amorites, Hittites, Perzites, Canaanites, Hivites, Jebusites, and I will annihilate them. You must not bow down to their gods or serve them or follow their practices. Instead, you are to demolish them and smash their sacred stones to pieces. In 34, 12 through 14, it says, Be careful not to make a treaty with the inhabitants of the land you are entering, lest they become a snare in your midst. Rather, you must tear down their altars, smash their sacred stones, and chop their Asherah poles. For you must not worship any other god, for the Lord, whose name is Jealous, is a jealous god. So again, the principle of the natural first and then the spiritual, we read in 2 Corinthians 10.5. We tear down arguments and every presumption that sets itself up against the knowledge of God. And we take captive every thought to make it obedient to Christ. Every thought or teaching that does not line up with the commandments of God, it's to be torn down. It's idolatry. Now, when Saul was anointed king, he was told to devote the Amalekites to destruction. Now, he did part of what was said, but Samuel declared, Does the Lord delight in burnt offerings and sacrifices as much as obedience to his voice? Behold, obedience is better than sacrifice, and attentiveness is better than the fat of rams. For rebellion is like the sin of divination, and arrogance is like the wickedness of idolatry. Because you have rejected the word of the Lord, he has rejected you as king. That's in 1 Samuel 15, 22 through 23. So rebellion against what God says, stubbornly acting against his commandments, is hating his knowledge. It is idolatry of self. 
we're going to take a little walk through Proverbs. <clears throat> 1 7 says, The fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge, but fools despise wisdom and discipline. 22 through 23 says, How long, O simple ones, will you love your simple ways? How long will scoffers delight in their scorn and fools hate knowledge? If you had repented at my rebuke, then surely I would have poured out my spirit on you. I would have made my words known to you, but you refused my call and no one took my outstretched hand because you neglected all my counsel and wanted none of my correction. In turn, I will mock your calamity. I will sneer when terror strikes you. When your dread comes like a storm and your destruction like a whirlwind, when distress and anguish overwhelm you, then they will call on me, but I will not answer. They will earnestly seek me, but will not find me. For they hated knowledge and chose not to fear the Lord. They accepted none of my counsel. They despised all of my reproof. So they will eat the fruit of their own way and be filled with their own devices. For the waywardness, which means backsliding and apostasy, of the simple will slay them and the complacency of fools will destroy them. But whoever listens to me will dwell in safety, secure from the fear of evil. Proverbs 2, 1 through 6 says, My son, if you accept my words and hide my commandments within you, if you incline your ear to wisdom and direct your heart to understanding, if you truly call out to insight and lift your voice to understanding, if you seek it like silver and search it out like hidden treasure, again, hoping you're recognizing Jesus was talking about that too, then you will discern the fear of the Lord and discover the knowledge of God. The Lord, for the Lord gives wisdom. From his mouth comes knowledge and understanding. 2, 16 through 22, it says, It will rescue you from the forbidden woman, harlot, from the stranger with seductive words who abandons the partner of her youth and forgets the covenant of her God. For her house sinks down to death and her tracks to the departed spirits. None who go to her return or negotiate the paths of life. So you will follow in the ways of good and keep the path of righteousness. For the upright will inhabit the land and the blameless will remain in it. But the wicked will be cut off from the land and the unfaithful will be uprooted. Proverbs 3, 1 through 7 says, My son, do not forget my teaching, but let your heart keep my commandments, for they will add length, of, length to your days and years of peace to your life. Never let loving devotion or faithfulness, which is the stability of truth, leave you. Bind them around your neck and write them on the tablet of your heart. Then you will find favor and high regard in the sight of God and man. Trust in the Lord with all your heart and lean not to your own understanding. In all your ways acknowledge him and he will make your path straight. Be not wise in your own eyes. Fear the Lord and turn away from evil. 3, 11 through 12 says, My son, do not reject the discipline of the Lord and do not loathe his rebuke. For the Lord disciplines the one he loves, as does a father, the son in whom he delights. Still recognizing these New Testament scriptures? 3, 31 through 35 says, Do not envy a violent man or choose any of his ways. For the Lord detests the perverse but he is a friend to the upright. The curse of the Lord is on the house of the wicked, but he blesses the home of the righteous. He mocks the mockers, but gives grace to the humble. The wise will inherit honor, but fools are held up to shame. Again, I, I hope you, you're, you're realizing all of these New Testament scriptures so that you can have a better understanding of what their meaning truly is. So the next time that you hear or you read, God loves everyone. 
understand that this is not in the Bible. God is absolutely fair and just to everyone during this time, right now. This, this is the time of refreshing. It's, it's fairness and justice for everyone because judgment has not yet come, but it will. But he also has an expectation of us. And it is why Jesus told us to love our enemies in Matthew 5, 44 through 45. He sent his own son to pay the wages of sin in the hope that all will repent. But he detests the wicked, those that will not obey his commandments and being fully persuaded in faith that they are righteous. It is the path for our lives. Proverbs 11.20, the perverse in heart are an abomination to the Lord, but the blameless in their walk are his delight. We are blameless in our walk when we do his precepts and his commandments. Proverbs 15.9 says, the Lord detests the way of the wicked, but he loves those who pursue righteousness. And I know that we have been taught that obedience to the law is works. And works do not justify that it is only faith in Christ Jesus. But Christ is the law if we can understand correctly. In looking at the examples of those that followed the law before Christ, the law was not followed because they trusted in it. They were not persuaded in faith to do these things. Rather, they were outward actions that the, the culture required. They, they did some of these things correctly, but then went out and did exactly the opposite of what they were told. They mixed it all in, kind of like what we're doing today, with idolatrous acts. It was not faith. The Pharisees pointed out how they followed the law, but, you know, it was, again, only for outward show. It was not from being inwardly convicted that they were the correct path. If you are fully persuaded in your heart of the commandments, it automatically produces obedience to it. That's what James was trying to convey in his letter. Grace does not overlook sin. Grace provides you the opportunity to examine yourself according to the word and turn away from evil. It is not about earning salvation. It is about being convinced that what God has prescribed is truly righteous. It's faith. We are absolutely no different from the Pharisees. You know, we focus on things like abortion, which don't, don't get me wrong. Abortion is wrong. But then we do not consider that leading people into error is something that God considers bloodshed. So, you know, we focus on one and forget the other. Abortion is bloodshed, but Christians shouldn't be engaging in this anyway. You know, what we don't talk about is the rampant sexual sin within the body of Christ. We don't talk about the usury of God's people. We don't rightly divide the commandments and teach them. We pay the tithe and neglect the weightier matters of separating and distinguishing God's commandments, which is judgment. We ignore the loyalty to the covenant, which is mercy, and we are not convinced or persuaded in what God says, which is faith. Jesus said in Luke eleven fifty two, Woe to you experts in the law, for you have taken away the key of knowledge. You yourselves have not entered in, and you have hindered those who are entering. So the experts in the law were the leaders of the people and they had taken away the key of knowledge. And we just read in Proverbs 1 that the fear of the Lord is the beginning of that knowledge. He said that they were full of greed and wickedness. They disregarded justice and the love of God. And again, justice means to separate, distinguish, judge, come to a choice or decision by making a judgment. Now, make no mistake, these people were full of making judgments, but, but incorrectly because they did not understand God's commandments. Today's leaders, they're telling us never to judge. You know, we're completely taking that scripture out of context. And it's also because we do not understand God's commandments. And there is 
absolutely no correct fear of the Lord being taught because they have turned grace into spitefully rejecting restraint of the fright, <laughs> the flesh and pridefully indulging in what God considers lawlessness. The fear of the Lord has been taught to us that like it's some sort of mamby pamby respect or some kind of adoration, you know, but I tell you when the sky is suddenly opened up and the veil that stands between us and God is removed, people are going to hit the dirt. They're going to be looking in sheer terror at the power of him, shame and dread filling their minds. Daniel was a man that loved God for his fear of the Lord and the Lord loved him. But he, even he could not stand for all of his strength as a human. It was completely drained. And this was the understanding that Peter and the other believers had when they saw Ananias fall down dead. The Lord removed his ability to live and breathe. And I can assure you was not some pathetic, you know, reverence of God. It was absolutely sheer terror, panic, and alarm. We have breath in our lungs only because God wills it. And if you don't believe me, that's in Job 12, 10, Psalm 104, 29, and Isaiah 42, 5. On the day that he returns, this is what will be experienced. Every knee is going to bow and every tongue will confess that he is Lord because of it. No one can encounter God and see his magnificent power and his majesty and stand. Colossians 3, 5 through 7 tells us to put to death, therefore, the components of our earthly nature, sexual immorality, which is fornication and harlotry, impurity, which is pollution by mixture, like with the world. Lust is emotions that are not guided by God. Evil, which is inner malice, inwardly foul, rotten and poisoned character. These desires. And greed, which is desire for more things and gain by extortion, which is idolatry. Because of these things, the wrath of God is coming on the sons of disobedience. When you lived among them, you also used to walk in these ways. All of these things are idolatry and they are lifted up against the knowledge of God, which are his commandments. In Deuteronomy 6, 4 through 9, it says, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one, and you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your strength. These words I am commanding you today are to be upon your hearts, and you shall teach them diligently to your children and speak of them when you are sit at home and when you walk along the road, when you lie down and when you get up. Tie them as reminders on your hands and bind them on your foreheads. Write them on the doorposts of your houses and on your gates. Now, again, this was repeated by Jesus in Mark 12, 29 and 30. He said that this was the greatest commandment in Matthew twenty two thirty seven, 37. And he told the scribe that the, that came and asked him, you know, what he would what he needed to do to inherit er, eternal life. Jesus told him that if he would do these things, he would live. Luke 10, 25 through 37. These things are all repeated in, in several places, but I'm going to give you two examples. Psalm 3, 3. Never let loving devotion or faith, faithfulness leave you. Bind them around your neck. Write them on the tablet of your heart. Proverbs 7, 1 through 5, my son, keep my words and treasure my commandments within you. Keep my commandments and live. Guard my teachings as the apple of your eye. Tie them to your fingers. Write them on the tablet of your heart. Say to wisdom, you are my sister and call understanding your kinsmen that they may keep you from the adulteress, the harlot, from the stranger with seductive words. 
Now, who is wisdom? That would be Jesus. In Isaiah 11, 2, it says, The spirit of the Lord will rest on him, the spirit of wisdom and understanding, the spirit of counsel and strength, the spirit of knowledge and the fear of the Lord. Christ is the living word of God. Who is the adulteress? Adultery means to turn aside, profane, strange, come from another man, excuse me, or place to, to go away. It is turning from your spouse to another in the marriage bed. It is the covenant place. It is turning from God by disobedience to how he prescribes that we live. So again, what were the, and they were supposed to, you know, tie as reminders on their hands and bind on their foreheads. It was God's instructions. It's his word. And now these are to be written on the tablets of our heart. It is the covenant that Jesus brought that was spoken of by Jeremiah in chapter 31, 33 through 34. And again, in Hebrews 8, 13, 8, 8 through 13 and 10, 16 through 17. For this is the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel after those days, declares the Lord. I will put my law within them and I will write them on their hearts. And I will be their God and they shall be my people. And no longer shall each one teach his neighbor and each his brother saying, know the Lord, for they shall all know me from the least of them to the greatest declares the Lord. For I will forgive their iniquity and I will remember their sin no more. But you don't get the forgiven of the iniquity and sin remembered no more if the commandments are not written on your heart. <clears throat> All of these decrees for how we should conduct our lives, again, have to be written on our hearts. And anything short of these is adultery. It is harlotry. It is idolatry because we are serving another, showing whose father we are from. God sees everything and has an expectation of what we are going to do in each situation. And he holds us accountable for all of our actions. So we can't know how to do that if we don't know his law. It is a reason. Jeremiah 3.16 says, In those days when you multiply and increase in the land, declares the Lord, they will no longer discuss the Ark of the Covenant of the Lord. It will never come to mind, and no one will remember or miss it, nor will another one be made. And Ezekiel 37, 26 through 28 says, And I will make a covenant of peace with them. It will be an everlasting covenant. I will multiply, er, establish them and multiply them. And I will set my sanctuary among them forever. My dwelling place will be with them. I will be their God and they will be my people. Then the nations will know that I, the Lord, sanctify Israel when my sanctuary is among them forever. This was repeated by Paul in 2 Corinthians chapter 6 when he is discussing being unequally yoked with unbelievers, which is idolatry, and that we are the temple of God. And this is also repeated in Revelation 21.3. Ezekiel 7. I'm going to read the whole thing and I apologize. It's really long, but it's super important. And the word of the Lord came to me saying, O son of man, this is what the Lord God says to the land of Israel. The end, the end has come upon the four corners of the land. The end is now upon you and I will unleash my anger against you. I will judge you according to your ways and repay you for all your abominations. I will not look upon you with pity, nor will I spare you, but I will punish you for your ways and for the abominations among you. Then you will know that I am the Lord. This is what the Lord God says. Disaster, an unprecedented disaster. Behold, it is coming. The end has come. The end has come. It has roused itself against you. Behold, it has come. Doom has come to you, O inhabitants of the land. The time has come near. 
the day is near. There is panic on the mountains instead of shouts of joy. Very soon I will pour out my wrath upon you and vent my anger against you. I will judge you according to your ways and repay you for all your abominations. I will not look on you with pity, nor will I spare you, but I will punish you for your ways and for the abominations among you. Then you will know that it is I, the Lord, who strikes the blow. Behold, the day is here. The day it's come. Doom has gone out. The rod has budded. Arrogance has bloomed. Their violence has grown into a rod to punish their wickedness. None of them will remain. None of their multitude, none of their wealth, and nothing of value. The time has come. The day has arrived. Let the buyer not rejoice and the seller not mourn, for wrath is upon the whole multitude. The seller will surely not recover what he has sold, while both remain alive. For the vision concerning the whole multitude will not be revoked, and because of their iniquity, none of them will preserve his life. They have blown the trumpet and made everything ready. But no one goes to war, for my wrath is upon the whole multitude. The sword is outside, plague and famine are within. Those in the country will die by the sword, and those in the city will be devoured by famine and plague. The survivors will escape and live in the mountains, moaning like doves of the valley, each for his own iniquity. Every hand will go limp, and every knee will turn to water. They will put on sackcloth and terror will overwhelm them. Shame will cover all of their faces and all of their heads will be shaven. They will throw their silver into the streets and the gold will seem unclean. Their silver and gold cannot save them in the day of the wrath of the Lord. They cannot satisfy their appetites or fill their stomachs with wealth, for it became the stumbling block that brought their iniquity. His beautiful ornaments they transformed into pride and used them to fashion their vile images and detestable idols. Therefore, I will make these into something unclean for them, and I will hand these things over as plunder to foreigners and loot to the wicked of the earth who will defile them. I will turn my face away from them, and they will defile my treasured place. Violent men will enter it, and they will defile it. Forge the chain, for the land is full of crimes and bloodshed, and the city is full of violence. So I will bring the most wicked of nations to take possession of their houses. I will end the pride of the mighty, and their holy places will be profaned. Anguish is coming. They will seek peace, but find none. Disaster upon disaster will come, and rumor after rumor they will seek a vision from a prophet, but instruction from the priest will perish, as will counsel from the elders. The king will mourn, the prince will be clothed with despair, and the hands of the people of the land will tremble. I will deal with them according to their conduct, and I will judge them by their own standards. Then they will know that I am the Lord. Now, all of this perfectly coincides with what Jesus said in Matthew 24 and with what Daniel says. And I know I said I was going to get into what Daniel 9 said this time, but I wanted to further show some corresponding things that were written so that we can rightly understand what Jesus is talking about. Because the fulfillment of what Ezekiel 7 said is part of what we will see on the day of the Lord. And this certainly did not occur when some Christians left Jerusalem to escape to Pella because Jesus said to flee Judea, not Jerusalem. <laughs> he said to the mountains, and we're going to discuss what those mountains are later on. And that's when the angels gather the people. Christians were warned by a prophetic word to leave Jerusalem in 70 AD. And Ezekiel just told us that vision, which is divine communication and a vision, oracle, a prophecy, that instruction, which is direction, counsel and advice are largely absent. So the escape to Pella is not what Ezekiel, Daniel and Jesus were talking about. Ezekiel said that the gold, the silver, which is money, cannot satisfy their appetites or fill their stomachs with wealth, for it became the stumbling block that brought their iniquity. So what are a large portion of the prophets of today prophesying? 
It's all centered around the wealth of the wicked being laid up for the just, which means they're going to get the the money and, and you know, they're going to get all the wealth and that people should build bigger churches. It was actually the prophetic word for pastors for 2022. They're decreeing and declaring that wealth comes to them. The church is literally a money-making machine for these people. And beloved, I pray that you will flee from these wolves. So I ask that you take this teaching before the Lord. Go search your Bible. Read the things that are presented here. Study them. Ask God to reveal to you if what has been presented has any validity. I pray that you are not one of these that treats these words with contempt and ridicule because we have literally been spoon-fed lies, heaping up teachers that confirm to us what our own hearts have already decided. And we have to do the work and take the time to study. Seek the Lord. Be blessed, brothers and sisters.